Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Aviva. Uh, before we kick start the presentation, let's get some of the formalities underway with forward looking statements. And now I'd like to invite Morris Tullock, our Chief Executive, to commence the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I love the, uh, the, the steps and, and the imagery we have here uh, this morning. Um, good morning, and welcome, everyone. I want to start with a reminder why I've taken this role. It's to change Aviva, to make us more commercially focused, more competitive, and bring us back to the fundamentals of insurance. You know, work has started at pace. We updated the market two months ago, and since then, we've made pretty good progress. At our investor update, I said we'd separate the management of our UK life and our UK general insurance businesses. And we have. I said we'd bring digital trading business back into UK GI. And we have. I said we'd reduce annual costs by 300 million pounds per annum by 2022, and we're on track. This is how I will run Aviva, delivering what we said we would. We've also made good progress on strategy, and today announce that we are evaluating strategic options for our Asian businesses. We look forward to updating you on this and the refreshed group strategy, as alluded to, in November. Now to our interim results. You know, I've inherited our market momentum here at Aviva, but more importantly, I now own these results. Operating profit of 1.45 billion for the half year is up 1%. Operating earnings per share are 27.3 pence, up 2%. And our dividend per share of 9.5 pence is up 3%. We have a strong and resilient balance sheet and well-run business units, and we've made good progress so far this year. But I wouldn't say I'm thrilled with the performance. It's just adequate. And I'm not interested in adequate, but the change journey for myself is only 150 days old. And whilst I'm incredibly impatient by nature to put Aviva on the right foot, I realize we will do much, much better. Aviva is ready and resilient for the uncertainty which may lie ahead but of equal importance, I want the company to have ambition and ultimately to have a robust strategy to realize its potential. Let's take a look at the uh, results snapshot. So looking beyond the headlines, there are five key points I want you to take away from today. Firstly, we have delivered resilient results in a challenging market with fewer one-off benefits. Our headline growth is subdued, and my ambitions for the business are much stronger. And quite frankly, they should be. But there are clear signs within the results of the quality and potential of our franchises. I expect our business to respond quicker to both market headwinds and tailwinds and be far more nimble. Second point, we are accelerating initiatives to improve the fundamentals. The change journey has only just begun, but tangible progress has already been made on structure, expenses, quite frankly, my favorite, commercial rigor. We have positioned the balance sheet for all seasons. So despite external uncertainty, we are ready and resilient. Our customers expect nothing else from Aviva. They trust us to help them save, Prepare them for retirement and protect what matters most. Four, we're delivering on our progressive dividend policy, increasing the interim dividend by 3%. And five, since my appointment, I've worked closely with the board on refreshing Aviva's strategy. In conjunction with this process, we have decided to examine strategic options for our Asian business. Our businesses in the region are strategically and financially attractive, providing strong growth opportunities and good returns. 
Our review will examine whether our current strategy and ownership structure is optimal in helping our businesses reach their full potential. A full suite of options is being considered. The broader strategy work with the board is progressing well, and I'm looking forward to our investor day on November 20th. Now, let's look at each of these in turn, starting with our performance highlights. Jason will take you through the results in more detail following me. I will, however, draw out some of the key themes that put our results into perspective and reinforce the strong foundations of our business. In life insurance, you can see on the slide our operating profit is down year on year. As we highlighted, however, to you in June, this year's interim results did not benefit from the 200 million longevity release that was included in the first half of 2018. And there were headwinds for our savings businesses caused by challenging investment markets. But looking deeper at how our franchises are competing in their respective markets provides some encouragement. We have seen resilient and robust levels of customer net inflows into our long-term savings businesses here in the UK and also in Europe. Both the UK and Europe saw net inflows of circa 2.4 billion pounds in the first half. And in both cases, this equates to 4% opening assets on an annualized basis. Flows into Aviv investors were more challenging, but we have seen a pickup in external mandate wins within Aviv investors of late. Perhaps more pleasing is the recovery of underlying investment performance at Aviv investors. You know, we now have 79% of our funds beating benchmark year to date in 2019. That's a pretty good lead indicator for what lies ahead. In general insurance and health, our first half results demonstrate that we continue to be good and consistent underwriters. Our general insurance combined ratio improved to 95.9%, which includes an impact of 0.8% by moving our UKD costs over into UKGI. We did, however, benefit from the weather in our major general insurance markets. Our recovery in Canada has accelerated as rates and claims actions begin to take hold. And we shifted our general insurance mix to more profitable commercial lines segments. You know, just as importantly, we maintained discipline when market conditions were less favorable, like the retail property and casualty sector in Ireland, and the motor insurance and individual protection business here in the UK. Aviva's core has been in a tight range of between 94 and 97% for many years now, despite the variations that naturally occur on weather and market cycles. This is a consistency is a mark of the quality of our underwriting results. The key takeaway is that our customers trust Aviva to provide their savings and protection, and this is reflected in results. But there's still plenty of room for improvement. On costs, on mix, on revenue growth, and how we allocate resources to generate the biggest impact on performance. There's also room for improvement in our corporate and debt costs. While these costs have declined due to, due to lower interest costs and reallocation of digital, the costs are still high, and this is something I plan to address. This brings me on to the topic of fundamentals. You know, at our investor update on the 6th of June, I spoke about the need to reduce complexity, drive greater commercial rigor, and improve efficiency. On efficiency, our plan is to reduce, to repeat, operating expense space by 300 million per annum, net of inflation by 2022. This is necessary to improve margins and make us more competitive in our markets. We are moving at pace. And while our results show that expenses are up 2% year on year, this is largely a result of carrying forward the high cost base from the second half. It's still unsatisfactory. Per our previous comments, we continue to expect operating expenses to be down in absolute terms over the full year. 
This expectation is inclusive of costs to achieve future savings. Run rate savings achieved so far in the first nine weeks are 25 million pounds. The transformation team is now fully in place and plans are mapped out for savings across the business units, functions, and group center. So you should expect some pretty bold action, including a significant reduction in the size of our group center and cutting project costs by a substantive amount. A more rigorous assessment criteria for new investment will give us substantial savings as we look to resize the change budget from 600 million pounds per annum to a more sustainable level that delivers value. When I talk about running Aviva and running Aviva better, I've set off that I want to run Aviva better with relentless focus on the fundamentals of insurance. And sorry if this is becoming boring, it may still be boring in five or 10 years. I'm gonna focus on customer service. I'm gonna focus on pricing. I'm gonna focus on underwriting. I'm gonna focus on cost efficiency. And I'm gonna focus on investment performance. We're not resting on our laurels. You know, in distribution, we've had some great new business wins that are currently in the contracting phase. And I look forward to to talking about those to you in due course. We're continuing to leverage our digital prowess to improve connectivity with our intermediary partners, making it easier, simpler, and more efficient to deal with Aviva. You know, for example, in the UK protection, we've introduced an online advisor portal, enabling self-serve and reducing inbound call volumes. We've also launched My Pension into the workplace business, where the leaders in the UK to further capitalize on that position. From a pricing and underwriting perspective, we're extending our data science expertise across the entire group, delivering quantitative and behavioral insights that are improving risk selection, driving increased retention, and ultimately improving lifetime value. There are many, many more examples, but there will be lots of time to look at those in more detail in November when we take a closer look at our businesses. Let's talk a bit, about, uh, a bit about capital. A key focus for Aviva, um, particularly in times like these, is the strength of our balance sheet. And our track record, which goes back years, as prudent financial managers. We've made huge progress in recent years, and I want this to continue by maintaining our financial strength and addressing areas of debate, which I've had with many of you, like debt leverage. At the 30th of June, our solvency cover ratio remains well above our working range at 194%. And perhaps more importantly, our surplus capital has held up incredibly well, and it's at 11.8 billion pounds. And our central liquidity, which is currently at 2.3 billion, certainly a high number in terms of my memory. These are strong foundations that give us resiliency in the short term and the capacity to fund our deleveraging plans in the coming years. You know, on the topic of debt, our credit rating was recently upgraded to AA minus from Standard & Poor's, it was last month. We're now rated in the AA range by the three major rating agencies, which is a mark of just how far we've come. We position the balance sheet to be strong and resilient across the economic cycle, and Jason will provide you with some additional disclosures on this topic. Let's turn to dividend. We've increased the interim dividend to 9.5 pence per share. This is an increase of 3%, and this is in line with our progressive dividend policy. Now, I expect you'll have some questions about how you should interpret today's dividend when thinking about future expectations. I'm not providing any quantitative guidance outside of reaffirming our progressive dividend policy, but what I would say is that the key point you should take away from today is that the dividend is driven by underlying performance of profitability and capital generation. We have a dividend that is sustainable and well covered by OCG, and we have a strong capital and cash position here at Aviva. In the short run, I would expect to see many of the actions start to work towards strengthening our OCG, such as being brilliant at the fundamentals, enhanced commercial rigor, and of course the cost reductions. You know, with that, let me invite 
Jason Windsor to the podium to present our financial results. Jason. Thank you, Morris. Good morning, everyone. Morris has summarized the results and progress on our early strategic thinking and how we will run the group better. I'll take you through the half-year numbers in more detail and give you some new data on capital generation and asset quality. Here are all the headlines in one place. Operating profit increased by 1% to 1.45 billion. Operating capital generation was 0.8 billion. The Solvency II surplus was 11.8 billion and centre liquidity 2.3 billion. Our Solvency cover ratio fell 10 points to 194%, largely as a result of increased SCR following interest rate falls in France and the UK. Dividend per share is up 3% to 9.5 pence. I would pick two points on operating profit to give a flavour of the overall performance trends. First, in life and asset management, these businesses have generally seen lower operating profit. This, as we highlighted in June, reflected lower longevity releases and the challenging marketing environment. Second is the improvement in general insurance, benefiting from the recovery in Canada, good weather, and this is despite moving digital to GI from corporate costs and other. <coughs> Turning to IFRS NAV. This increased by 8 pence per share to 432 pence. As the chart on the left-hand side illustrates, the increase largely reflects operating earnings per share of 27 pence, our final 2018 dividend of 21 pence, IFRS 16 relating to the treatment of operating leases, and of course the recent Ogden announcement. We have had positive investment variances in the first half, and these more than offset amortization of AVIF and other intangibles. As a result, basic EPS was 28.2 pence in the first half, up three and a half times compared with the prior period. It's worth touching on investment variances, as we've had questions from many of you on this. Variances largely arise because of the choice we make on capital management. We manage our capital on an economic basis to protect the Solvency II balance sheet. This is the capital which drives our ability to meet regulatory requirements and pay dividends. This approach can result in some volatility in IFRS profit, which we classify as non-operating. I would also highlight amortization costs. This is an area where I'm reviewing our presentation, particularly for internally generated intangibles. This is to ensure our reported operating profit is most aligned with the business's performance. Our solvency surplus was resilient in the first half at 11.8 billion. Own funds grew by 0.8 billion after paying the final dividend, also 0.8 billion. Not least from the reduction in bond yields, our balance sheet and SCR expanded. As a result, our Solvency II cover ratio fell 10 percentage points. The current yield environment does pose challenges for how we manage capital and product mix. This is especially the case in our French and Italian businesses, where volatility has required active management. I am focused on capital generation, and as you can see on this slide, I've provided additional disclosure on OCG in the first half, breaking out the own funds and SCR components, and adding information on new and existing business, we should help you better track and understand capital generation. In terms of OCG in the first half, underlying generation was flat at 0.7 billion, as was the investment in new business at 0.1 billion. The decrease in total OCG of 0.1 billion was mainly from moving UK digital from non-insurance into UK GI. Looking now at cash, the picture here has remained quite strong. Remittances were a touch under 1.6 billion this half versus 1.5 billion in the prior half. There wasn't a special remittance in the first half of this year, though we did benefit from accelerated phasing from a number of businesses. The timing of cash flows from the business units does vary due to a range of factors, including internal capital demands and board meeting timetables. This is why we look at total remittances over a longer period than six or even 12 months, typically three years. Our centre liquidity now stands at 2.3 billion. Given we are prioritising cash deployment into debt reduction, it is possible our centre liquidity will remain strong for the foreseeable future while we wait for debt maturities to come around. In the meantime, it gives us additional flexibility to deal with challenges that might arise from the macro environment. On the topic of macro challenges, 
it's worth spending a moment to revisit our investment portfolio and balance sheet strength. We know there's considerable uncertainty in the political environment. But the key point is, we've built this balance sheet and the asset portfolio to withstand all weathers. It's high quality, and we've not weakened our lending standards to chase growth. We have 93 billion of direct shareholder-backed assets, and we invest those assets to deliver secure long-term returns, measured by economic capital and real-world spreads. The key points to draw out are, our corporate bond exposures are diversified and high quality, with less than 1% rated below investment grade. Our average LTV in commercial mortgages is 56%. You can see more details on the commercial mortgage portfolio in the slide, including the breakdown between sectors, office, retail, and others. Equity release mortgage LTV is 26%, and new business LTV is 19%. And our effective HPI assumption is 0.7% per annum. We have a long-standing strategic hedging programme to manage the equity and spread risk. As a result, our capital position remains relatively insensitive to movements in equity markets. A 25% fall would cause a four-point move in our cover ratio. For corporate spreads, a 100 basis point increase would only hit our cover ratio by six points. Our exposure to interest rates is mostly limited to France, where we've stepped up our active management. We have significant buffers in IFRS and Solvency II for adverse Brexit outcomes and the second equity release consultation. All in all, we have a strong balance sheet with highly controlled exposure to credit and market risks. Now turning to leverage, another topic that has featured prominently in our investor discussions. We've committed to taking debt down by at least £1.5 billion by 2022. Set out here are two of the metrics that we use to monitor our leverage Solvency 2 basis, and S&P as representative of a rating agency approach. The most important to me is the Solvency 2 basis, as this is the economic balance sheet and is the main focus of our regulators and informs us as to how much debt capacity and dividend capacity that we have. Our leverage ratio on this basis, including all hybrid, senior debt and commercial paper, was stable at 33%. On a pro forma basis, adjusting for 1.5 billion of debt reduction plans, the leverage ratio would fall to 29% and would reduce interest expense by 90 million pounds per annum. On the new S&P leverage calculation, we are 35%, comfortably below the S&P neutral threshold. And as Morris mentioned, we were pleased S&P upgraded our financial strength rating to AA- last month. We've made considerable efforts over the, a number of years to improve financial performance and the resilience of the balance sheet. And to be rated AA range by each of the major three rating agencies confirms the progress we've made. Let's change tack and shift focus from the group financials to the business performance, starting with UK Life. IFRS pro operating profit was down 13% to 722 million. As we highlighted in June, our analysis of our longevity reserve position will be completed later this year. So we didn't have the benefit of a longevity release in the first half, unlike last year. As a result, the contribution from other declined by 70 million. Excluding this line and the legacy portfolio, operating profit was down 1%. Looking at the trends in our major product lines, annuity and equity release volume was 16% lower at 2.2 billion. We wrote 1.2 billion of BPAs, a good performance, albeit lower than the prior year of 1.5 billion. By the end of July, we were flat year on year in terms of volumes written in BPAs. Our BPA pipeline remains strong, and whilst we con will continue to be selective, new business volumes in the second half look good and, and beyond that. In group protection, new business volume grew by 38%. This more than offset the 9% reduction in individual new business in what remained a competitive market. The challenging new business environment in individual protection flowed through to our IFRS results, with lower new business contribution leading to a 4% reduction in operating profit. And in long-term savings, net flows were stable at positive 2.4 billion, with continued success in the workplace pension market. Net flows were also positive in the retail platform and looking across the industry, our performance has held up relatively well. We now have platform assets of £26 billion. 
Taken together, in a challenging environment, the UK life business has had a reasonable performance, but our ambitions for this business are much higher. In Europe, the results are steady. Let me start with the life business. The 2% decline in operating profit from our European life businesses was primarily driven by lower profits in France and Poland. In France, our largest market in Europe, our results reflected challenging investment conditions, higher expenses, and lower profitability and protection. These declines were partly offset by continued strength in our Italian business, which grew life operating profit by 32%, and Ireland, where we benefited from the acquisition of Friends First. The increase in OCG was largely due to management actions. Our trading activity remained solid across the European businesses. Life new business volumes increased 9%, with continued strength of hybrid product sales in Italy and strong demand for participating products in France. You can see the impact of product mix and low interest rates in our VMB margin, which fell from 4.5 to 3.2%. We will need to keep looking at our product mix and volumes in the second half, given where yields currently are. General insurance in Europe showed relatively modest progress overall, with growth in France offset by lower profit in Ireland. Net written premium was broadly stable, and like other markets, we're seeing higher volumes in commercial lines. The combined ratio in GI remains strong at 92.9%, with benign weather offset by elevated large losses and a gradual softening of the GI market in Ireland. UK GI had a solid first half. The combined ratio was up 1.4%, with the benefit from favourable weather offset by lower levels of prior year development and an increase in costs owing to the move of digital, as I mentioned before. Net written premiums are up 2%, with 7% growth in commercial lines, offsetting a 1% decline in personal lines. We tried to manage volume in personal lines in what has been a soft pricing cycle, and that has helped preserve profitability. In commercial, we maintained measured growth in top line and attracted profitability. Our SME and our corporate and specialty businesses continue to make very good progress. One of the major initiatives in UKGI has been the alignment of UK digital direct trading under the UKGI business. The businesses weren't sufficiently joined up, and combining them will help to improve our competitiveness in the direct-to-consumer and price comparison channels. Canada is delivering a healthy recovery in its results, with the combined ratio improving by over 7 percentage points to 97.5%. The benefits of pricing and claims management initiatives have begun to emerge. With the rate increases implemented in March still to earn through to results, we remain confident in the sub-96% combined ratio target for 2020. The pricing response necessary to restore profit margins has had an impact on, lower new, on new business, and this is reflected in lower net risk and premium in retail lines. This was expected and was a trade-off we were willing to make to restore profitability. With widespread increases in pricing across the market, retail volumes should normalise over time. Turning now to Aviva Investors. It's been a challenging 12 months or so for asset managers, and Aviva Investors has not been immune, with revenues and operating profit down in the first half. Our continued focus on fundamentals has helped to deliver improved investment performance in the first half. More than 75% of our funds are beating their benchmark at the end of June, and we've seen AIM's performance bounce back, with the target return and target income funds up 6 and 9% respectively. That is a good leading indicator for the third party business, and we've seen some large mandates, one in fixed income, that landed in July. So the trends are encouraging, even though the results may remain challenging in the near term. Asia has continued to perform well in the first half. We've grown operating profit with Singapore and China leading the way. In Singapore, our largest market in the region, growth in operating profit was helped by an improved performance from our health insurance business. We've continued to build our financial advisor distribution, which is now at over 1650 advisors, and this helped to deliver 24% growth in business volumes and a 14% growth in VMB. So to conclude, my focus is on improving operating capital generation, delivering on our cost-saving target and reducing debt leverage. While the external environment remains challenging with very low interest rates and ongoing political uncertainty, 
Our balance sheet is strong and resilient, and we remain focused on serving customers and making disciplined trading decisions across all of our businesses. We are also working to capitalise on the tailwinds from a lower cost base, from a leaner and clearer organisation structure, which should help us capture the long-term growth drivers in each of our markets. So I'll close there, and now, thank you, we'll move to Q&A. John Hawking, please. Okay, Greg. Crystal. Crystal, too. Morning. Hello. Thank you. Um, good morning. John Hawking from Morgan Stanley. Um, three questions, please. Um, firstly, on UK life, in terms of the underlying um, OCG, if you look at the... Um, the chart, the underlying OCG seems to be flat year on year, but the underlying operating profit seems to be down, mainly driven by the legacy. Could you talk a little bit about what the outlook is for that OCG, given how important it is as a proportion of the group? Um, secondly, Morris, you said that you are, I think, dramatically resizing the change budget <coughs> downwards. Does that mean you're also reducing the amount of change, or are you going to do the change in a different way? Um, it's the second question. And then finally, on the, on the leverage illustrations you've given, um, both on a subsidy 2 basis and also on an S&P basis, is that purely the numerator effect there, or, or are you assuming something for book value growth over the period? Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, John. Why don't, I'll take the second question, and Jason can, can get ready for the, the first and the, the third question. Um, I think when I, when I looked at the, the change budget, it was, it was running approximately about um, 600 million uh, per annum. You know, John, if I go back historically, um, that number used to be far closer to, to 350 to 400. It's not that I'm anti-making investments. If, if, you know, if I can make an investment and uh, reduce my IT run costs, for example, by 30%, then that I'd make that investment. But you do get a capacity in terms of the number of projects and the ability to actually man manage those. So that, that, that's the first consideration. The second consideration is I want far, far greater you know, commercial rigor. You know, I've never seen a bad business case. You know, if someone brings me a business case, that, that's them signing, you know, in stone, if you like, about the costs they need and the benefits they're going to derive. And, and quite frankly, um, both the costs have crept up on original business cases and the benefits have never been realized. So I'm resizing the change budget um, to make a much more appropriate level for Aviva so that we can deliver on the proper investments. And that's part of one of my thematics on commercial rigor for the organization. Jason, you want to? Sure. On, on UK capital generation, in the, for the last three years, UK has been phenomenally successful at generating capital, um, you know, largely from significant one-off actions and, and the like, which you're, which you're aware of. We are very focused on underlying capital generation, and as you imagine, it's a business in transition from some of the older products to some of the newer products. So we, it is very much on our minds, and it's all of our planning and thinking is to make sure that we can grow that number. So we, we measure quite carefully how much capital we spend on new business. Um, and then we're obviously taking actions around margins and cost reduction, which will generate further growth in OCG over the, over the period. On leverage, I mean, the, the, the numbers on the chart were just a simple um, lop 1.5 billion off the numerator and the denominator and give you the pro forma number. It's not a forecast as part of the plan. Clearly, if we do grow book value, you know, that would be a, a lower number. Greg Patterson, KBW. Three questions. One is, um, in terms of the persistent, persistently large losses in, in uh, GI, is, does that not concern you That's in terms of underwriting standards having slipped there or terms and conditions or some issue there? I wonder if you want to talk about that. Second point is, just want to update where we are with AIMS. And the third thing is the Singaporean court case where the Pru is suing you about uh, basically the bulk of your agents uh, having come from there originally. I was wondering, you know, what, what some thoughts on that and the potential liability there. Yeah, Greg, let, let, let me start. I'll start with the, the, the third question. So the, the PRU is not suing us. Uh, they're suing Peter Tan. Aviva, Aviva is not, not party. So that one's, that one's pretty simple to, to answer. On our general insurance business, I, I'm actually, you know, quite pleased. I mean, we've seen our you know, reported core come down to, you know, 95.9. I think uh, that's on a group-wide basis. Um, that includes 0 0.8, you know, for the one-time movement of the UKD costs over. Otherwise, it would have been 95.1. Um, it also looks quite good on, on a normalized basis. Um, you know, we're going to get, uh, you know, large losses, and we're going to get weather. Um, we didn't have weather. It was rather benign. Um, the large losses are not certainly not outside of the range that, 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 we, that we would expect. 
on that, so there, there's no real, real concerns there. I, I think on Ames, let me start by making a, you know, a comment, and then quite frankly, I might ask um, Ewan, was Ewan, um, to make a point, so we can just get the mic over to Ewan. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, in, investment performance in, in, in flows are, are a function of, of, of performance, and, and you know, Ames has, has had good performance. I think, you know, I would say, and, and I'm, I'm sure Ewan will, will back me on this, that uh, Q4 last year, in particular December, w w was not a good period for, for Ames, and, and hence we, we've seen some of the, uh, the, the outflows. But if you look at the performance in, in Ames this year, and, and Jason alluded to it in his commentary, um, it's been very strong and, uh, you know, leading, uh, leading performer in sort of multi-asset uh, fund performance. So, I mean, you're in, you obviously probably have additional insight. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think obviously it's a, it's a high margin product and quite rightly people do pay attention to it. Um, and over the last uh, 12 months or so, we've seen about 3 billion leave, leave the, the Ames portfolio. Um, the, the flow is going two ways now. Um, and I think, I think for me, one of the really important things is we have been quite investing in the investment capability and, uh, and we're seeing the benefit of that. So a big project for us was turning around the best performance. Part of that was building out the, the equity team that obviously cost us some money. But um, as well as the, the, the number in terms of number of funds beating benchmark year to date, our long-term track record is restored. So we've got um, over three and five years, 75% uh, of our funds um, exceeding benchmark. So. I think that both Ames and their other propositions and credit equities and, and everything else are in good shape to sell into the future. So I think you know the problem with fund management is when you underperform, you get you, you get punished and rightly so. But when you perform, generally things are just and uh, and you start getting the flows. But there's a, it's a lead indicator. Oliver Steele, Deutsche Bank. Um, so you've announced that uh, you're looking at strategic options in Asia. Um, I'm wondering if that means you've ruled out strategic options anywhere else. Perhaps you can just sort of talk about perhaps what, you, what you've ruled out. <laughs> um, if you do sell any parts of Asia, um, would you look to pay down debt earlier? Um, Jason, you made some comment about sort of keeping cash high, waiting, to, waiting for the maturities of the debt. Would you actually consider buying those back in earlier? <laughs> and then the third question, probably on the same sort of theme, is you were able to pay down the one and a half billion of debt over the next few years <coughs> in any case out of future sale proceeds and uh, out, of ex you know, out of free cash generation. Um, so if you, if you raise money earlier through any disposals, um, what would you then be thinking about using the, the, the spare cash for? Oliver, morning. Um, let me, let me take, take, take all three of those uh, questions. Um, so I think, first of all, we've decided to examine strategic options for Asian operations. You know, that, that's what I've announced today. Um, however, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I mean, there was lots of... Uh, um, potential outcomes on, on doing a strategic review. We said we're reviewing the businesses, and I will review them with a focus on enhancing shareholder value. Um, you know, clearly, I have a, a framework as I as I look through you know Aviva's businesses and, and opportunities where I, where I want to invest. And um, certainly, I'm not going to share what that framework is. Um, nor am I going to comment necessarily on the value of the businesses. But what I would say is they are strategically and financially attractive, and I am looking for ways to, to enhance value. Um, and I will update you further and everyone further when I have more to say. Uh, can, it, can you just quickly comment on the debt maturity profile? Yeah, would, sure. would you wait for that maturity profile? I mean, we're, we're very, we're, we've laid out our plan that we, I think, um, was even before the June, but we, we reiterated that, the one and a half billion um, by 2022. We've only said 2022 because that's when debt maturities allow us to do it in the, in the natural way. We've had lots of um, discussions about accelerating it, and it's certainly something that we haven't ruled out. You know, we might look at that as, as, as we sit here today. Um, we're very happy with the liquidity position. You know, we, we do want to reduce leverage uh, steadily over time, and, as, and debt reduction is a priority for our use of cash flow. Uh, this is Ashik Masudi from JP Morgan. Just a couple of questions, both kind of related to uh, the interest rate scenarios where we are at the moment. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, how do you expect to offset the headwind from that, especially in GI and in European business? So, for example, France and Italy, because it should be impacting your European life business as well, just the way interest rates have gone down to almost like negative now. So that's one. Secondly, I mean, given what interest rates have done, do you still feel comfortable about taking out special remittances from these subs? I mean, I mean, credit market is still very, very good. So what's the point of taking out special uh, remittances at the moment from from uh, businesses in case you are considering taking out from European businesses or say some other business where uh, there is some excess capital. So what's, what's your update on that? Clearly, I mean, things have changed where we were in March and where we are at the moment. So has anything changed in your view? Yeah, great. Thank I you. Mean, thanks for both those questions. I mean, Jason. Sure, look, I mean, interest rates does pose a financial and a strategic question for us. Uh, and we are um, very conscious of the financial side of the equation. We've got excellent uh, capital management and ALM teams, you know, that really help us, you know, we, we present you the capital position today following interest rate falls. We've had interest rate falls in July, quite sharp ones, uh, particularly in France, uh, as you probably were of. And we, we, you know, we built the balance sheet to withstand uh, that the best we can. Um, you know, but we've had to take further action as well. You know, it's given the, I think we've had about a 1% move in the 10-year in the swap rate. The, the, the longer-term question around um, savings products is one that we've been talking about, frankly, since 2012, and we've been seeking to change the product mix in Italy and France toward, in Italy, more hybrid products, into France, more unit-linked and protection products, and that strategy will continue. So we're trying to have a much more balanced business that doesn't have, you know, overall. But, we, you know, if, if rates stay where they are, we will need to continue to react. <coughs> Yeah, it doesn't have any direct impact on dividends per se. I mean, clearly, there is an impact on the on the capital and and, and, and across the piece. But our, uh, our initial thinking, you know, once it will start to uh, to impact somewhat the capital that's available for distribution, there's no there's no immediate impact. Thank you. It's James Shark from City. Um, three questions from my side. Um, firstly, I just wanted to think about the strategic review on, on, on Asia. Um, obviously, it's not a disposal as such. It's just assessing um, your various options. Um, the first question around that would be, are there things to consider when it comes to existing joint venture agreements, um, partnerships, if it comes to disposals and change of ownership uh, type clauses, please? Um, secondly, then, thinking about any potential proceeds, which again, it's just a review, so it's not a disposal. But when, when I look forward at, at your reduction um, in debt, the 1.5 billion, um, to go further on, on, on debt, even if you wanted to, which it sounds like you don't need to, um, you'd have to tender for debt, which would be expensive. Um, that then leaves the opportunity maybe to do share buybacks um, at some stage, but then that's going to increase your leverage again. Um, how do you actually think about um, when you're changing the shape of the group, or you might change the shape of the group, um, what you might actually do with those proceeds and how, how you actually might deploy them. Um, final question, um, just around the dividend. Um, so it's obviously the first time you've given the progressive um, policy 3%. Is there anything we should read into that about the underlying earnings power of the group? Thank you. Great, thanks, James. Let me take number one. Um, I'll also take uh, the, your third question, Jason, you might want to add, add a bit more commentary and um, uh, I'll let Jason take the, 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 the second one. Um, so let me, let me go back to the strategic review and, and not to be overly repetitive, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Um, we're going to examine that business and uh, you know, look at all options with a view to, to creating, creating value. I did say if I go back to previous comments I said, and I, and I do want to get into a kind of a culture where when I make a statement, I follow through on it, and I hope we get to that kind of that kind of cadence. But I said I would leave no stone unturned, um, and clearly, you know, I had some some pretty good ideas when I took the job as to, you know, the things I would look at, and obviously I, I've worked with my team and and, and certainly the board, um, you know, and that will continue. But I also think that you know we are leading towards November, and, and come November, you know, we'll give greater clarity onto. You know, uh, you know, Aviva and, and where I want to take it. But, uh, you know, we've commenced, you know, a, a review of Asia today and uh, we'll look at in, in all options. You know, on the third point, um, what should you take away from, from dividend in terms of underlying results and, and, and you know, in future sort of thinking on, on dividend? Um, we said we're going to move to a progressive dividend. We weren't going to give a specific formula, but, but 
clearly I look at, at, at three things. I look at the remittances, you know, and not just the current, but, but the forecast for remittances. You know, I look at the capital um, generation um, and also look at both the current results and, and, and future results. And, and, in, and in making that, there's, there's nothing more to read than those are the factors that, that we looked at. Um, and obviously, the dividend's ultimately a, a decision taken by the board, and that was a conversation, a conclusion that we arrived at, uh, you know, earlier this week. Do you want to talk about... Yeah, I haven't, I haven't got a lot further to add. You know, if, if, if we did have extra liquidity, and it's somewhat hypothetical, again, you know, we're very comfortable, you know, with, with the position today, but I, I'd be even more comfortable if we had more liquidity and, and a stronger balance sheet. So there'd be no burning need to return it, and certainly share buybacks are not on the agenda. So we would look... Um, again, at debt reduction being a priority. The second question in terms of joint ventures and, and various agreements with you know, bank insurance style. Yeah, I, I, as, as it relates to the strategic view, all options are on, on the table. You know, we have uh, wholly owned businesses there. We have ones that are you know, existing joint ventures, so we're not going to exclude anything in a, in a review. Um, good morning, Sandra Crean of Autonomous. Uh, three questions, if I can. Firstly, could you update us on what's happening with FPI and getting the A Avipop um, proceeds back to home? Um, secondly, um, new business profits uh, in Europe fell quite materially, and you're warning about uh, lower sales, I think, in France and Italy because of lower interest rates. Should we expect a lower level of volumes? Uh, not just for the second half, but going forward if interest rates remain here. And thirdly, in terms of cost savings and restructuring, I assume restructuring costs will now be part of the operating uh, 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 remit, in which case, roughly when will the cost savings uh, you know, in 2020-21 actually overtake the uh, restructuring costs being taken in the operating profit? Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, morning. Um, let me let me tackle the first one. I'll let Jason comment on the the second and third questions. So, uh, with, with respect to FPIL, um, those those conversations continue um, with the Hong Kong regulator. Um, those conversations actually were as recent as, as a couple of weeks ago, um, so they're progressing. Um, with respect to the Avipop uh, proceeds, uh, they're held in the Italian business, and the underlying solvency in our Italian business is all in our green zone. So. Uh, um, we're, we're comfortable on that. So, do you want to talk a bit about the uh, yeah, sure. outlook for Europe? And um I mean, the, the, the first half is actually quite instructive. You know, you've seen actually a surge in interest um, for for guaranteed products, as you might imagine. Um, and we've been seeking to temper that with offering, you know, attractive other alternatives uh, across the board. Because the the level of guarantees, whilst is appealing, and you know, there's only so far you know, we can continue to credit these rates. So the, um, the as I said earlier that there's a balance between it having a unit link business or a hybrid business in Italy. Um, we continue to see good growth and there's still very strong demand you know, for products. So it's, um, it's up to the businesses actually to continue to re-engineer you know, their product mix and sell you know, attractive margin products. I think to do with the cost one. It was the yeah. yeah I think on the, I, on the on the costs. I mean, I think I said this on June the sixth. We, we are taking the restructuring costs through P and L. We haven't charged any uh, in there for the last couple of years now. So that that will dampen you know the the progress. So we've said the full uh, benefit of the cost saves will be in the twenty twenty two run rate. The um, in, in in the meantime, we are making progress. So if you look at the as, as Morris said in his remarks. You know, cost reduction already this year. I think you can see the second half last year is the sort of high watermark. So we are already down materially versus that. So if you sort of double, you know, the first half costs um, for the full year, that that will start to give you a sense of the, the, the progress. But the fall in, in in 20 and 21 will be slower because of the restructuring costs. Yeah, we're we're also in the planning season right now. So in terms of capex, which is a pretty significant portion, um, you would expect our plans that we do and they roll up from all the business units to start to tackle uh, the capex amount. We're making you know strong progress on the lean group center, and we have a team in place and uh, you know plans afoot for every business unit, every function, and the center. Um, so I would expect that to start accelerating. Uh, it's uh, Johnny Vo from Goldman Sachs. 
just three questions, if I may. Just in terms of the liquidity, um, I know you'd probably want to keep a buffer in your centre holding company. So how much of a buffer would you want to keep in there? And then what is excess? And then what would be the pro forma leverage if you deployed that excess to pay off the debt? That's the first question. The second question is, I noticed that the BPA volumes were down at the half. I just want to see your competitiveness relative to your peers. Legal and General quoted that their MA spread net of the fundamental spread was about 121 bips at the half year. So I know it's very high because of the asset mix and yours is much more defensive. So if you could tell me what your MA spread is. And the third question is just in regards to the remittances from the BUs. Um, could you tell me the approximate split, percentage split, coming from what geographies in terms of the remittances? So of the uh, 1.5 billion odd. Okay. Morning, morning, uh, Johnny. Um, I'm quite comfortable having a nice liquidity buffer, but I'll let uh, Jason provide you with uh, more, more, com yeah, more I, commentary, and then perhaps I, Angela f uh, on the BPA question, and then you should tackle remittances as well. So. Okay. Well, um, I mean, it, as it relates, to, well, remittances is the easy one. The, the, if you look through the pack, you will see we've broken it out by by country. You can see Europe is where the biggest phasing has taken place. Um, it's uh, in, in, in the big European markets, so that's uh, uh, reasonably evident. The um, on, on liquidity, I mean, there is no there's no reason from a risk appetite perspective. You know, we couldn't actually pay off the the long term debt today. You know, but I, as, as I said, I'm much more comfortable having liquidity buffers as we go into you know what is going to be an uncertain second half. You know, we have to be realistic. So we are we are being very measured, um, and you know, th there's lots of things that we can do to manage liquidity. We don't sort of bring it all up to the group, but we are we are liquid both in the subsidiaries and in the group, and we'll continue to be prudently positioned as as, as we go through the next uh, next six to twelve months. Angela. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think the uh, reported MA spread we have in our re uh, results is 96 basis points. That's uh, sure. slightly lower than it might be over the full year. We had um, a little bit of um, drag in June on an uninvested asset. Um, in terms of BPA generally, I think we're very comfortable with where we are. We have, um, as, as at July, we're back to flat year on year um, and, and living within our appetites and, and managing our balance portfolio, making sure that BPA is a, it's an important but uh, not necessarily a massively growing part of our portfolio. So I think we're very comfortable with where we are. We compete in certain parts of the markets uh, very well. Thanks. Gordon Aiken from RBC. Um, three questions, please. First on longevity um, and the smoothing factor. We had a competitor of yours yesterday um, indicating they would smooth future mortality gains, in particular the one from the 2018 tables. Um, they'd be sticking with a, a smoothing factor of 7.5 rather than the default factor of 7.0. Just wondering, do you intend to do the same as them? Um, second question on the house price inflation assumption. Um, I think it's at 0.7 percent. Is that solvency to, I assume it is, what's your IFRS assumption? And the third question on the second equity release mortgage consultation, you seem to imply from your comments that you were prepared for a negative there. Um, what are your expectations? Because, of course, we've already had considerable you know, detailed guidance from the PRA. Okay, thanks, Gordon. Um, I think on, on longevity, I, ha I have had the, the pleasure of lots of discussions about smoothing factors. Um, I wouldn't profess to understand them all, um, but it's, it's something that we are taking into account um, as, as we look at 17 and 8, as the analysis we did on 17 and the analysis we're doing on 18. I'm not going to give you precisely how we're doing it today, but we are we're doing the work. We take CMI as one input. There's lots of other mapping and other data that we take, um, particularly from occupational pension schemes, into looking at setting our, our reserves in the round. We entered the year, I think, as we said at the, at the full year results, and again in June, in a very strong position. You know, when we look at the uh, the longevity reserves overall, and we look at the trends that are in CMI 18, that's all very supportive. Clearly, as I think as you mentioned previously, we've seen um, slightly lighter mortality this year. We'll need to factor that in. On the HPI assumption, that's both. The, the, that, that, that's effectively the NNEG calculation that goes into both the IFRS and the, um, 
and the solvency two uh, test. So we've got the effective value test for solvency two, and then we've got the, the IFRS balance sheet. So that's net of, <coughs> net of all the adjustments that we make for, for dilapidations and cost of capital and the like. And no, we're not signaling anything new on the ERM consultation. You know, that consultation, I think, is now uh, closed, uh, but then the PRA is considering it, and, and we, uh, we've been an active participant in that, and we um, will uh, look forward to the responses. <clears throat> Thank you. Dom Imani, ex and BNP Paribas. Um, three questions, if that's all right. Um, Firstly, just coming back to the, uh, the cash remittances, could you just help us understand the phasing in a, a little bit more detail? Is that a front-loading of stuff that might have happened in H2, or is that a delayed effect from H218? Um, secondly, um, in terms of the new business piece, um, clearly some of the metrics are down there, whether it's you know, sales or flows. Is there anything about, if I think about the VNB number, is there anything about that that you might single out as sort of distorted, whether, for instance, the movement in rates um, had a distorting effect on that, um, or indeed anything else that might lead that to bounce back. Um, and then thirdly, um, I wonder if you could just remind us how the uh, Ubi Banker arrangement works. Um, clearly, you'll have seen the press report suggesting they're looking to sell their insurance business. Uh, as I understand it, you have a JB with them. Um, what, could, what, are the, uh, what are the terms of that? Uh, what sort of option price might there be on, uh, on your share of that if it were to be bought out? Thank you. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, Jason, why don't you take the, the yeah. cash businesses and timing? Uh, v and B, I don't know if it is it specific to a region, country, or is it overall? Just just overall, fine. We can start, and maybe we okay. can call in some other people, and, and I'll take the uh, the question on on the Italian bank relations. The phasing was much more within 19, um, so it, it was mainly in Europe. And you can see those the, those numbers as I as I mentioned. I think we I could come with the precise number. It's about 500 in the in the first half. Um, you know, Europe won't be doing a billion for the year. Okay. Did you want to talk about VNB? Oh, the VNB margin. Um, like again, it's, it's, as I said, it's it's primarily a European issue. You know, UK margins are down a little bit. You know, we, 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 we are reasonably faithful. We don't play with risk margins or anything like that. We, we give you the number as, as, as it comes through. And we give, I think, quite a useful map from VMB to solvency to capital generation. And I've sort of expanded that a little bit so you can see a couple more extra line items to sort of walk you through new business in the back book. So uh, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail offline, perhaps. I think within Europe, it's very much about product mix. I mean, volumes have been up nicely. Product mix, clearly the VMB on the traditional savings is lower than on protection and unit linked. Um, as I said a moment ago, you know, we continue to manage that mix. Our, our Italian business um, is performing strongly. Um, we saw profit up, you know, 23% at, at the half year. That, that was with us being, you know, cautious on sort of some of the economic uh, uncertainty. Um, a few years ago, we diversified that, that distribution. Um, we now get uh, over a third of our sales from, from Pernacle. Um, as it relates to both Ubi Banca and, and Uchi, um, we've got strong relationship with, with both. Both provide us um, good flows, um, and we're in active conversations with, with both around contract renewals. Through Gelot, uh, HSBC, uh, two questions on GI. Firstly, um, intact. Uh, pointed to reserve strengthening around the motor book com coming from two provinces. Have you guys seen similar trends? As in, could you talk a bit about that? Secondly, um, could you also touch on the UK personal line, as in what are the trends you're seeing both around pricing as well as claims inflation on motor and home book? Thanks. Okay, thanks, Joe. I'll, I will start with a couple of comments, and I'll probably ask uh, Colm Holmes, who's responsible for general insurance, Aviva, to, to arguably give more color than, than I'll be able to give. So, um, we're pleased certainly with our, you know, with our, our, our Canadian turnaround. I mean, um, it's far from complete. Um, you know, as a former CEO of that business, I, I have clear expectations on where it should run, and, and we have a new CEO in place who's actually here today in Jason's store. But, but please, at, at 97.5. You know, currently there, there, there were certainly were two provinces that were most challenging, and, and I think on, you know, the, the uh, formidable competitor that you mentioned, the, the references to Ontario and, and Alberta, um, we had taken action in both. Um, in Ontario, it was specifically about getting rate, 
Um, as I mentioned on, um, I think, March 7th, we had 18 points or eight on our RBC book and eight on the Aviva book. That was further eight from what we had taken in, in, in the previous uh, quarter. Um, Alberta is a little bit different because Alberta, it was a, it's, it's even more regulated. And uh, the action we had taken was to entirely suppress new business um, and hence the, uh, the, the contraction which, which actually flowed through in our results. We were uh, you know, down two in personal lines and, and, and up seven in, um, in commercial lines. It was a shift mix and that's a, a mix that, that's, that's by design across our, our GI franchise. Um, here in the UK, um, obviously, you know, rates have been pretty flat to, to slightly down. Um, we're now starting to see average premiums kind of go up about a point. Um, I think those will accelerate on the back of the Ogden decision. But, Colm, you probably have a bit more insight that, that you can uh, share with Drew. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't add anything much else on Canada. As Morris said, Alberta is a very different market. There's rate caps in place. So I think what intact are seeing is exactly what we were seeing, and that the reduction in premium is driven by the fact that we very significantly depress new business in that market, and Ontario rates now coming into the market. Um, their inflation is not hugely different to ours, quite frankly. Canada is also seeing inflation. Escape of water is continuing to be an issue there, and um, particularly far, whereas in the UK, we know with inflation in motor um, is running at about 5%, net around 3%. And similarly, in home, we're seeing uh, inflation. Now, coupled with Ogden, we do expect rates to continue to harden into the future. So the rest of this year and into 2020, we'd expect to see a continuum of hardening in rates, particularly in property. Uh, in motor, it's still a competitive market. And as Morta said, I mean, what we've been looking at is remaining disciplined. And what we've seen is significant growth in our commercial business, where we you know, delivered a core of 94.3 for the half year, which is uh, very pleasing. And it's predominantly in liability and property and not the motor classes. Min Zhu, Pamu Gordon, just two questions, please. First, um, your UK life book. Um, would you be able to give some color in terms of the OCG um, sort of between how much new business do you need in terms of volume and margin to offset sort of the, your back book sort of going off um, in order to maintain or grow the um, OCG? And uh, um, just going forward, and second question is on the Aviva investors. It has been quite disappointing in terms of you know, overall profit contribution to the um, group's earnings compared to some of the composite. You know, is there plans um, put in place? You know, do you have an ideal sort of um, target or, um, profit contribution to the group um, going forward? Thank Great. you. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks Ming. I'll, I'll let Jason take the first question, and I'll take the sure. second. So no, on, on, it's hard to give you a precise answer because it, it, it's subject to lots of things about mix and types of products and, and the speed of the runoff. But you know, we, we, we recycle capital pretty well. You know, we've got many capital-like businesses. Only annuities really has a longer payback, and that's sort of in the five, six-year time frame. So the capital that we're reinvesting is coming back to us relatively quickly. Um, when we're growing in places like platform and work place pensions, which brings through you know, much more capital generation over time. Um, so I think, I think the outlook, as I said um, <coughs> earlier, is, is, is to grow OCG, um, but we will, you know, it's, it's not going to shoot up you know, as, as we look to invest, business, uh, invest in new business and continue to manage the back book. We'll be managing margin, product mix, and, and costs. Uh, Ming, first thing I would say about Aviva Investors, it's, it's, it's core to the strategy you know, at Aviva. Um, I like the future uh, prospects, certainly here in the UK, and in, in savings and retirement, and, and having a strong asset manager is certainly critical. Now, to, to your point, um, you're right, and I think you and I would share disappointment that um, you know that we're down 14 million at the half year. Now, about half of that was was expected. You know, we obviously in, in, inherited you know lower average AUM. Um, we started the year. Um, we probably had investment performance um, in the previous year, which was kind of inconsistent with, um, you know, certainly uh, huge swaths the last two decades where Aviva Investors has been a consistent performer. The good news is that lead indicators turn around. You know, as I said, and, and Jason said, um, we had two different numbers. I think I said 79, you said over 75. So we probably both said 79, we just said it, uh, said it differently. But 79% of our funds are, are beating benchmark, and, and that's, that's a great indicator. We've seen that translate already into some mandate wins. We had, 
you know, a couple of billion in, in, in new mandates just, just in the month of July. And, and certainly when you look at our, our, at our signature fund, the, you know, the AIM series of funds, the, the performance in, in the half year, you know, up, up six and eight, I think, year in, um, is a pretty good indicator. Um, but we also have a great sort of real asset business and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing, you know, external flows from that. I mean, our overall third party, third party funds were, you know, at the end of June, we're, we're down 0.9. So, uh, listen, I, I expect to be investors uh, to, to turn around and uh, um, it's quarter, Aviva. Fahad, please. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, Blair Stewart from BAMO. Um, first question on the UK uh, GI. Um, if you adjust for the uh, reserve releases and the and the weather, I think it was about a three point uh, change year on year on the, on the underlying adjusted combined ratio. Uh, maybe half of that is because you loaded additional expenses in the digital. But what's going on with it with the other? You know, is is there actually an underlying deterioration in the combined, or is it just? normal volatility with large losses or something else, business mix. Just on that, and, and secondly, just on Asia, um, a few points of detail. Um, why was the Singapore profit down? Um, could you give some color on, the, on what's in the other 22 million? Is that mainly China? Um, and FPI, you're saying that you are expecting to complete in the second half of 19. Uh, how much certainty do you have around that, given what's gone on so far? Thank you. Great, um, thanks, Blair. I'll I'll take uh, the first and and, and third, um, and let uh, Jason deal with the Singaporean profit and the other. Um, you're right to say the the normalized at 99.3 for UKGI does include the, the one-off loading of UKD costs. Um, that's about uh, 1.6, um, so it'd really be 97.7 versus 96.1. Um, and, and obviously, the big sort of adjustment factors are, are, are weather and, and, and a, you know a little bit on on uh, some some uh, large losses. But but we're pleased, and you know we obviously were at the certainly on the personal lines business. We were kind of at the, the bottom of the cycle, um, and obviously you know rate adequacy will now strengthen. We we saw the market start to move, and you know Ogden, whilst uh, there was an associated charge of 45 million, we'll start, certainly start to see. Um, some pricing pressures so that we can get uh, rates up to the net inflation, which is always a, a good indicator then of, of, of future profitability. On FPI, yeah, I expect it to complete in, in, in the second quarter. Um, it's been a long journey. Um, you know, we, we had a, a fairly substantive list of things we were working through with, with, the, with the two regulators. Um, that's now down to a very, very short list. and. Uh, um, certainly, uh, myself and uh, my director of uh, M&A and my CFO are focused on getting those answers such that we can uh, complete that transaction. Yeah, I, in, in Singapore last year, and we, we, as he said, we, we remediated it um, through um, different um, performance of the health insurance business. We had some significant repricing and actions that we needed to take um, through that. Within the life business, overall sales were up. The profits down slightly. It's a business mix change between savings and protection. Some of the protection was slightly higher margin um, with a slightly different profit signature. I think we've tilted it more towards saving, which has got a longer term, you know, better VMB and longer term value profile. Yes. Um, there's a few other, I don't think that's right, yeah, it is mainly. The, the, the it's fine. We finish with Fahad, please. Hello, good morning. Uh, Fahad Chingazi from Media Banker, just a quick question. Um, are you seeing any tangible change in the competitive environment in individual protection, uh, workplace pensions, and home insurance? Um, because Lloyds Bank did a 10-minute presentation, their results, and they're looking to target growth here in workplace individual protection and be the number one player in home insurance. So are you seeing any changes or any impact from them? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me start off with a, with a high-level comment. I may ask um, Angela and Colm to add, add some more color. So probably the most competitive segment we've had anywhere in the group has been individual protection. Um, you know, we've seen a, a, a number of uh, new entrants into that market. Um, certainly. Um, our margins have, have held up, uh, you know, re reasonably well. 
I think what's more important as a leader in, in workplace, um, you've seen our group protection business, um, you know, is up 38 percent, um, so that's strong. Um, home insurance, uh, you know, I, I, I like the fact that we're a multi-distribution play. So, you know, we have uh, um, partnership agreements, um, many which have long tenures uh, remaining um, with a number of the key banks. Um, that's obviously a, you know, a vehicle. We saw a really good growth in our, in our digital and direct um, home insurance business. Um, and we also have our, our broker force. So our, our routes to, to market, uh, coupled with our, our product offerings and our and our claim service uh, give me lots of confidence in what is a very attractive segment uh, of home insurance. So, um, Angela or Colm, anything you'd like to add? Um, I, I, only a little bit. I guess, in, in, as, as, as Maury said, in, in protection, there's, there's been a hugely competitive market already this year. And um, you know, we're working really hard to make sure that we're competitive on price, that we're really focused on pricing at the right places at the right time. Um, we have very good products and propositions and good broker uh, references, but we you know, have to be there with price in those markets. So that's really our focus. And we've really seen, started to see the benefits of like, picking up um, in the sort of later in, in, in H in H1 this year. Um, on workplace, um, we, we are number one. That is a, it's a hugely difficult technical market to enter. I think we get um, a lot of coverage from EBCs for the technical knowledge that we have in, in those teams. So I think we continue to be confident of our number one position in there. We're still seeing growth in funds from existing plans and, and new, new funds coming through. So we will always have to stay on the front foot on that. But um, I think we're in a very strong position. The, the thing I would add on, 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 on workplace, we're, we're number one. The, the, the key to playing uh, in that is, isn't necessarily your products and offerings. It's your ability to do the administrative platforms. And uh, we have a competitive advantage in that space. On, on home. Um, home uh, your question to home. Yeah, I mean, inflation ran higher than we were expecting. We're now rating about three or four points above what the ABI is predicting in terms of rates, so we expect that to come back. Uh, we've also changed our mix of business, so our broker channel is down about 6%, but where we are seeing growth is in our direct channel. Um, so uh, we expect come the end of the year, you'll see an improvement in the core in the home book, and then that will flow again into 2020 as the rate we're applying actually starts earning through. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, appreciated uh, you coming out here this morning. And uh, I just reiterate uh, you know, a couple of themes. Um, it's early days yet uh, for me at Aviva. I'm pleased with the performance. I'm pleased with the fact that, as an organization, we're ready and resilient uh, for what lies ahead. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to setting a new course um, for this great company. That's why I took the job. Um, my ambitions are uh, endless, and I look forward to seeing all of you hopefully in November to share a bit more of that. So thanks very much and enjoy your day.